What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, where since the year of 2008, we've been bringing you ideological ingredients so you can think, reflect, and brew your own faith. And today, on the podcast, we are joined by John Dominique Crossan and Brian Zahn. We're going to be talking God, violence, empire, and salvation. This was a live stream, the first of a series of live streams with Dom and a different third chair as we explore uh, his visual lecture series, The Historical Jesus, which is going on right now here at Homebrewed Christianity. So if you enjoy this conversation and you go, whoa, whoa, what was it that inspired over 3,000 people to sign up for that visual lecture series, send in questions and provoke the conversation I just heard with Brian Zahn and John Dominique Crossan? then go to crossinclass.com. You can donate anything you want, zero to a million, and then you'll get access immediately to all of the lecture series and invites to join live the next few weeks as we'll be joined by guess who? Guess who? Brian McLaren, Diana Butler Bass, and Jennifer Garcia Bashaw. Each week we'll be tackling questions from the over 3,000 people that are a part of this online community. You can hang out with them in the community Facebook group and all that kind of stuff too. So head over to crossandclass.com to join the fun. Now before we hop in, I want to let you all know Pre-sale tickets are live right now for Theology Beer Camp. I, I messaged the people that signed up on the website that said, tell me when tickets go on sale. And we've only got like 30-ish, maybe a few less than that, of the pre-sale tickets. And then we'll start announcing who's coming, prices go up, and all of that. So if you want to grab the cheapest ticket right now to come join us October 17th to 19th in Denver, Colorado, then head on over to where? theologybeer.camp that's a website theologybeer.camp grab your ticket and uh, get ready to come nerd out with your geek out me a whole bunch of scholars a whole bunch of podcasters live music tasty beverages and all the goods all wrapped up in an exciting and exciting weekend this fall theologybeer.camp all right here we go it's me brian zahn john dominique crossan on the podcast. Enjoy. And so, uh, that's why, that's why my friend Brian Zahn is here. One of the only people who managed to visit me in Scotland while I was there those three years because of the, the COVID. Um, someone who has joined the live stream before where we got excited about J.R.R. Tolkien, my nomination for a new canonical text. Um, but also, uh, a, a, a church planter, preacher, author, and such. So, but maybe before we get going, um, uh, Brian, maybe you could introduce yourself a bit just to let people that may not be familiar with you and those uh, that are excited to engage a lot of Dom's work that uh, haven't hung out in the part of the church you're in. Yeah. Thank you, Tripp. Yeah, I'm Brian Zahn. I am the founding pastor of Word of Life Church, and I've been the pastor there for 42 years. <laughs> And uh, I, my roots are in the Jesus movement. I'm a Jesus freak. And, uh, and I've just stayed on the journey. I'm also an author. I've published, I think, 11 books in the last 15 years. Uh, most recent being The Wood Between the Worlds. And uh, so that's what I do. That's, that's what I'm about. Awesome. Well, um, now... One of the things we thought would be a good way of uh, kind of setting up these conversations is move them in a number of different parts. First, uh, to let uh, Brian kick things off with the kinds of questions and ways Dom's work has impacted, the questions he's wrestled with and such, and allow uh, him to kind of share that, Dom to interact with it, uh, and then we'll get a conversation going. And I've been organizing the 97 questions that were sent in this week uh, by topic. And picking ones related to, uh, you know, organize them by topic that I thought, oh, these will be fun, fun topics to throw out and see how, how uh, Dom and Brian discuss it. So uh, but if you're, you know, if you're on the live stream presently, feel free to drop questions in. You just put the word question in front of it. Uh, that way I know it's a question and y'all aren't just talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so take it away, Brian. Tell us. Uh, kind of your relationship with Dom and his work and the kinds of questions that uh, mm. have 
that you've wrestled with? Yeah, well, first of all, this is a delight. John, Dominic Croson. I mean, I'm, I'm encountering him, at least, you know, as it were. I, but I have, I have been a devoted reader, uh, Dom, of your work for a long, long time. I got a stack of books over here. There's, there's the Revolutionary Jesus or whatever that's called. Yeah, Jesus yep. Revolutionary Biography, Power Parable, How to Read the Bible and Still Be a Christian. That's one of the newer ones. And boy, that's a you got to do that. But I, I've got a few here. I want to say just a little bit about which one to start. This one here, God and Empire. Oh, man, that influenced me a lot. I mean, if you just thumb through mine, it's it's all marked up. And, and I have I've read that deep. I've read that two or three times. I really have. And that would be uh, like a key text in my life, really influencing me. I want to tell you, I'll say something about this one with, you wrote with Marcus Borby, The Last Week. I totally took that and have been doing it for probably, I don't know, 15 years now. During Holy Week at our church at Word of Life, we have services daily, daily, it's like, you know, several times a day, where I just basically do that book. And I just, I just take... Here's what happened on Monday. Here's Tuesday. Here's Wednesday. And I create, you know, meditations and prayers and all of that. So people might not think that whatever I am, I'm not sure what I am. I mean, I come from, you know, the Jesus movement, the charismatic movement. They wouldn't necessarily think that I'd be using John Dominique Croson work, but but I am. I'm using it a lot. Uh, I love I love this book, uh, Resurrecting Easter. I love it so much that I, I probably preached a couple of Easter sermons from them. That's a pretty new book. It's also a beautiful book. I think my I think my Easter sermon maybe two two or three years ago was called uh, the Resurrection of the Dead Ones, which you know that's that's Dom's translation of that passage there in Romans one, and I just just totally use that. And then the last one I want to mention, maybe this is one I'm most interested in maybe have a little conversation about is render unto Caesar. I read that one carefully. Uh, I've read all of, well, all that I have read of Croson's work, I've read carefully and I've read a lot. Um, this one, you know, this is the book where, where we're trying to, you know, how do we engage with culture? Do we demonize it? Do we canonize it? We read, we read Luke Acts and we see, and I'd never noticed this before. But in fact, Luke can never bring himself to bring any kind of critique. <laughs> All the Romans are cast in the best light possible. Uh, Luke cannot bring himself to tell us, oh, and by the way, they finally chopped his head off. <laughs> He's not going to tell us that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> of course uh, <laughs> The last word is unhindered. He just, nobody hindered him. Well, until they cut his head off. But other than that, um, but then you have, you know, Revelation where where culture is, at least Roman culture, Roman Empire is uh, certainly demonized. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is the, this is the realm of political theology that I engage in a lot and I never am comfortable. I mean, I write a lot on it. I speak into this a lot. I get asked to do this a lot. And as far as my political theology goes, every time I hear myself speak, I find myself disagreeing with myself. Yeah, but I don't know that I really believe that. So I can't ever find my perfect balance on that. Uh, but I, this book helped me and I liked it. And I, I um, the, the question I have, though, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to ask a question, but I guess I can do what I want. I'm talking right now <laughs> is. Uh, um, I think it is possible to read Revelation not merely as, okay, the Romans have been killing the Christians and just hold on a bit and now Christ will become the killer. He'll repudiate the Sermon on the Mount and come kill Romans. I mean, I know you can read it that way. And I know, and I know, you know, that's that's some of the worst readings of Revelation, in my opinion. Um, I, it is possible to bring a nonviolent, because I'm, I'm committed to Christian ethic of nonviolence. I mean, I'm committed to that. I, I think it's possible not just to jettison that book, but to interpret it in a nonviolent manner. 
I've done some stuff with John Baer, you know, Orthodox scholar, along in, in that world of interpreting Revelation nonviolently. Now, look, I, I don't know what the authorial intent was. You know, John the Revelator, did, did he really? Maybe he did. Maybe he did. But maybe he did anticipate a violent divine response as the solution to the problem. But, I mean, once once the text enters the canon, it's no longer under the pure jurisdiction of the author. Now it becomes, you know, the possession of the church and we interpret it. So I, I in the present American context, I am tasked, just because where I'm situated, I'm trying to pull people away from a conflation of their Christian faith with the American empire. And the book of Revelation is very helpful text in doing that if you can interpret it. Uh, properly, but that also requires me to find a nonviolent interpretation. So I just I teach I teach it all as, as symbol. It's all symbol, you know. And so yes, the the white horse rider is going into war, but he wages war not with a sword in his hand, but from his mouth, and he's already drenched in blood before he goes into the battle. And I just I play with it like that. I say, look, I think I'm among those that have been slain by the word of Christ and then raised to newness of life. So. Anyway, let, let me just let me just close this little opening bit by saying I I so appreciate your work and I have never read anything by John Dominique Croson that didn't that I didn't benefit tremendously from. So, and I think some some people that kind of know me might find that surprising. I, one little anecdote um, in my most recent book, I quote Dom. And one of the early editors said, well, could you could you find someone else who says something similar? I said, I might, but I'm not going to. So that. So there. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> OK, Brian. Thank you. On that one. Let me take a look at it. Um, <laughs> to start with a small point, I would not jettison this book. I'm not going to say I'm happy it was put in. I would, if I had to vote for it around, you know, yeah. the year 350, I probably would have gone with those who would voted against it. But I would like to have our brutality up there where we can see it rather than have it okay. Where, you know, I live about half an hour from um, Disney World. I wouldn't want the Bible to be like Disney World, all oh, beautiful, peace and love and joy. That's what I like about the Old Testament, that you see the vision quite clearly and you see ordinary people, not bad people, working like mad to avoid the vision. Mm -hmm. It means they get it. It's not that we're deluded with all this stuff. So in how to read the Bible and still be a Christian, I watched a pattern going through the entire, yeah. Bible, entire Bible, which probably biased me towards the reading of this, that it I think you're absolutely correct, and I think the majority would probably go with you. Most scholars say they can find that it, Tom Wright once said to me, but it's all symbolic. Yeah, but so is the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> very often, but they're very different symbols. And I think people have read the symbols. So, But at least your point, I think, is not a minority at all. I'm probably in the minority by saying this is intended to... I had to explain to myself why it was so violent. It wasn't enough to, to interpret it as I did. Mm -hmm. You quoted it quite right. God, did, uh, the Romans did this to you. God's going to do it back. Why is he so violent? I mean, he's totally wrong. <laughs> the Romans didn't do this. So we know historically he's wrong and theologically he's wrong because they don't think God would do it. Now, the big question I had to ask myself that most scholars have not asked themselves yet. Granted, even if you interpret it like that, why is his, are his metaphors so violent? <laughs> the battle hymn of the Republic comes straight out of the book of Revelation. It, yeah. it's, not, it's a magnificent hymn, but nobody's kidding themselves that it's just metaphorical. My answer to this is what he is really after is a correct interpretation that Roman imperialism is about, my terminology, Mediterranean globalization. Mm -hmm. It's not about grabbing land. It's about trade. 
And Rome is the center of this Mediterranean globalization, for real. Mm -hmm. Now, there's not a word in this whole thing about the legions. They're not even mentioned. But the traitors <laughs> get a whole chapter, chapter 18. It's like, why are the bad people? He's after Christians in these churches who are saying, as I said to Paul, and as I continued to say successfully, I don't see why I can't be a good Christian mm -hmm. and a good Roman. No, no, I'm not. I'm not going to buy this divine emperor stuff. No, I've dumped that. But you know, if my I'm trading in olive oil, and I'm dealing with people who are, let's use the word pagan for shorthand, and they invite me to come and have a meal in my in their temple. I'm going to go, and of course I'm not taking it as sacrificial food from it. Paul said, yeah, of course you don't. John is horrified. Mm -hmm. Recognizes the nose of the camel <laughs> is already inside the tent with trade. And he's right. Darn it, we know that today. Let's not talk about globalization as imperialism. Let's talk about it as open trade or something. So John, rightly or wrongly, as I read it, is trying to paint you a picture so bad that how could you even dream of having anything to do with the Roman Empire? And it's totally fictional. <laughs> Rome did not slaughter Christians. But I, can, I can't find a, a Christian in that whole apocalypse who basically isn't probably dead in heaven as a martyr. <laughs> so my interpretation is that he paints this horribly brutal, a wash in blood Roman Empire and counter a wash in blood Jesus so that there's no in-between. He doesn't want the in-between people whom Paul knows all about who say quite rightly, what's wrong with going to a feast in the temple, which is where rooms are for rent, of course. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with the gods. What they care are the sacrifice or eating sacrificial meat for sale. They're saying, nah, this has got nothing to do with it. He wants no surrender. So that's why I see him. Now, because of that, the violence is important for me to take seriously because he's trying to horrify you. Successful. So I don't think it would be right for anyone to just say my interpretation without going into that and insisting that most people who would take it, you know, many people tell me it's the only hope of some battered people that they read this and say, yeah, but you know, I don't like kids growing up in Belfast throwing stones at tanks on the way home. I don't know if that just goes away when they hit 14 and 15. So I, I, I think I would prefer if people could come up with a better image. I understand, I do understand how a downtrodden people are going to fight back. Of course they are. And Ukraine, are anywhere. of course they will. And it doesn't matter if the whole church tells them not to, because they will. So I'm not a pacifist. But basically behind all of this for me, Brian, is an evolutionary challenge. Mm -hmm. How will we stop violence that imperils us as a human species? That's really what I'm after. It's an evolutionary, I was going to say it's not an ethical problem, it's an evolutionary problem, but I prefer to say it's an ethical problem because it is an evolutionary problem. So I, I, would, I would really ask people to be very careful to say, well, you can understand that the sword in his mouth, which, which you said, is simply the power of the word. But the power of the word is persuasion. I would, you know that picture that I have there where Jesus has the book in his hand and he's right. right and that's persuasion. And look, what I'm doing now is persuasion an act of power, if you will, but you could tell, get lost. <laughs> what can I do about it? I don't have a spear in my hand, wouldn't. So I, I want the power of persuasion to be the opposite to the power of force. And that's the, my, the final thing in Render unto Caesar, that there are two powers in the earth. And I never think of talking truth to power. You're talking the power of nonviolent resistance 
to the power mm-hmm. of violent force. There are two powers, and I see only one of them saving the human species. So it's way beyond Christianity or religion for me. It's whether we can in some way or other, despite our agreement that if Russia attacks Ukraine, Ukraine could, should, would strike back. Of course. But how on earth then as a species are we not a doomed species? Mm-hmm. Now, I, you know, one of the things that uh, showed up in the questions uh, exactly around this, and I know there's a bunch of people hopping on because uh, my computer restarted and I clicked the start the wrong session. So a bunch <laughs> of people were logging on as you were hearing Dom respond to Brian's first question. Um, they were waiting uh, for the Brian's on session to start and I clicked the Brian McLaren one. Oh, uh, dear. Yeah. So the, 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 you know, the, the 300 of you Brian. that popped on while Dom and Brian are talking about Revelation missed uh, the first part of the prompting. Um, but there's a question uh, around this that might be a fun follow up, right? You mentioned, Brian, in it um, that, that uh, throughout Dom's work, that conflict of power. Uh, the, in something like the last week, or then how you read scripture, like how do you stay a Christian and read the and, and continue to read the Bible? Uh, that's all there. Um, and um, let's see, it was Cindy asked. Dom raises the question of power, empire, and the uncomfortableness around that question uh, in biblical studies, right? In his own research, and brings it to the fore. Uh, Brian has raised it to the fore in a congregational context where the habits of reading for imperially compliant religion uh, exist in a different form. Um, and I wonder how they would uh, understand uh, the other's position and what it's like to read against domination systems um, you know, from each other's perspective. And you know, knowing that that was what you raised first, Brian, uh, maybe share a bit about how, right, like where a publisher's like, can't you footnote someone else when you're raising these questions? Uh, but, you know, those are in books where for your community, you're pressing right around these issues. Like, what do we do with the tradition? What do we do with power? What do we do with violence? Can you kind of share your own uh, experience of that and what it's like to uh, then watch people in other disciplines, like academic ones that ask those questions, but have a different constituency uh, and a different framework for negotiating it. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with everything that Dom just said. I mean, I agree with all of that. The difference between us is simply I'm not a scholar working from the academy. I'm a pastor that's working with a congregation, and I, I have more hope. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to remove the book of Revelation from the canon, but I think it it has to be. And by the way, I would also if maybe I would have voted. I probably would have voted. Let's not put this in the canon, or at least let's let's issue a disclaimer <laughs> at the beginning of it. Cancel, uh, cancel culture. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Let's just like uh, can we interpret this symbolically here? Let's not try to be. So, so I don't have any choice other than to help people interpret and read the book of Revelation in a way that many have not, because it's been hijacked by those that want to use it to legitimate all kinds of state violence that, you know, uh, that, that America is, I mean, one of the things I try to do the most is try to get people to see that America is not a kind of biblical Israel, but a kind of biblical Babylon. And then already there, you see where I'm coming from, that that's my general stance. And so I am prone to to be very critical of empire. And and dang, you're, you're partly to blame for that, Dom. I mean, you wrote the book, you know, God and Empire, and it influenced me. <laughs> and uh, so so if, if I have to work with the book of Revelation, and I do, because I can't just you know, pretend it's not the close of the canon, and then you get the left behind crowd that wants to do everything with that, then I don't have any choice, I don't think, other than to bring to fore a nonviolent interpretation of the book of Revelation. This is what, you know, people like John Baer, to a certain extent, Tom Wright, 
and others have been doing. Uh, there's some others on Michael J. Gorman. I think he does really good work with that. And so I don't think actually we disagree with if we're going to talk about authorial intent of John, the revelator, I don't think we'd probably disagree there. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that that authorial intent is not the end of what we do with the book of Revelation. It's yeah. 2000 years yeah. later. We have it in the canon. We have to work with it. That's fair enough. Uh, one thing that might help you is, for example, if you if you use that term globalization to, to really touch home, yeah. why is John clearly not focusing on tradespeople? Mm -hmm. Why is that his big thing? And where are the legions? I mean, if, if you're talking about the Roman Empire and you're against it, I'd say, surely you'd mention the legions. Aren't they the bad guys? You know, so you could go into that, and that links directly with imperialism is about globalization. <laughs> the British knew that. <laughs> it, it had exactly. nothing to do with just grabbing land. <laughs> it, it had to do with trade, basically. It has to do with a McDonald's in every city on the planet. <laughs> it, it really does. I mean, it's not, it's not trade in a benign thing. It, it's, <clears throat> It's the form of imperialism that really works best. So that's one thing. One other thing I'd like to say. On the one hand, I've never had the, <laughs> the responsibility of giving a sermon on Sunday and having to live with those people on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> what happened it's to me... It's a real deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have no experience of that. So here's the limitations of my experience. From in round numbers, when I left the monastery, um, let's say in round numbers... 1970 to 1990. I was writing within scholarship for my fellow scholars, but the Roman Catholic tradition demanded you take a degree in theology, a doctorate in theology before they let you near scripture. You couldn't get a doctorate in scripture. <laughs> First, you had to get a doctorate in theology. They were right, I think, by the way, because we're dealing with theology. So for 20 years. Now, that means I was always talking to the, the guild of scholars but I was watching out of the corner of my eyes. Now, yeah. what happened in 1995, after the historical Jesus came out, which really was written for scholars, it really was not written for normal human beings. <laughs> the fact that it didn't have footnotes was on the devil's It got out of the cage, though. <laughs> I know, but what happened all of a sudden, I get a call from my editors, do you know you're going to be adopted to dump? Can you go on the, the road and push it? I'd never done any of that stuff. I started in the 90s getting invitation from churches. Mm -hmm. That was not my plan. And by invitation, I meant come on Friday night, give an hour and a half, three hour and a half on Saturday, and preach on Sunday. Eh. <laughs> I hadn't preached for 30 years since I left the priesthood, honestly. Almost exactly 30 years. So I was invited to do it. Now, the only thing that forced me to do is to be very clear, because I didn't write a book. I had to talk for a half hour, uh, an hour, and then give a half hour question. That's the, the pattern. It forced me to be clear, clear, succinct. And then if you get on television and you have five minutes, you have to be even more succinct. But I was saying the same stuff. I never, ever dumbed in thing down mm -hmm. I really didn't and I kept getting invited I ran up a million miles with United which was lovely None, honestly Brian it wasn't in my plans I loved it I really did because I could see the value of it but I was I didn't have what you had to say I, I would come for the weekend and be gone but it kept up for 20 years or so really and we anti COVID stopped it. So I was always talking in church, and I would say to people, if I'm a heretic, then you have to explain to me why there are so many congregations out up there that invite me. I don't have an agent, for example. Push me. I had no agent. I, I, I get an email, would you come? Sure. Um, so I was watching very carefully what was happening out there, not from your experience or from a different experience all across the country. So something was happening. I was basically giving them, theology is for me, the transcendental meaning of history. So put bluntly, you begin with history. 
if you begin with theology, then you can say anything you want and go off into superstition. So theology, the transcendental meaning of history, which means, of course, interpretation. His meaning doesn't jump out at you. Now, I wasn't into spirituality from that because I spent 19 years in the monastery and I knew all about spirituality. I took it for granted that spirituality depended on theology. And the bad theology gave you bad spirituality. But that was my experience. And it was not, honestly, it was not my intention. Had that stopped, I would have gone on writing for my scholarship and I probably would have argued, you know, the methodology of <laughs> the historical Jesus, the life of Mediterranean Jewish peasant intended, talk about authorial intention, to raise a huge question about methodology with my colleagues. It, it, it certainly didn't do that. <laughs> You know, but that's what, that's my own experience. People wanted to hear this. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and you're, you're an excellent communicator. I mean, you're just gifted with that. So, you know, if I see you on video or documentary, you're always very articulate. And, and so there's no, there's little wonder why people invited you to come speak because you're good at it. But it, it didn't, they weren't afraid of it. You know, honestly, it, it wasn't like I was saying, a certain other stuff for them, it's just like you know, I didn't do the footnotes and all of that, but but they were getting history, mm -hmm. they were getting the theological men of history, and sometimes people would say, "Well, do we have to know all this stuff?" And I think, well, yeah, in the same way that you live today and you have to know what's going on, you're talking about people two thousand years ago, and why would you presume? you know what they're talking about just because they wrote it down in Greek or something and you translate it into English and you got it. <laughs> why, why, would you, why would you expect to go to another country today and turn on the television and let's say you know the language and know what on earth they're talking about? You know, I go home to Ireland and I read the newspaper and I don't even know what they're talking about half the time. I'm out of the matrix. So we're trying to get people back into the matrix mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago. Sorry, that was too long a bit. Well, no, no one, of the, one of the questions that came in under different forms um, uh, was really about uh, the challenges to um, introducing Jesus in his own historical context to people who have so often uh, made Jesus, in a sense, culturally commute to uh, the American religious, cultural, political landscape. Um, so, you know, often in our public discussions around religion, if you're an academic or if you're uh, uh, leading a congregation, um, it's the external cultural framing uh, that dominates uh, the, the, the agenda, and then you have to figure out a way to adapt to it. Um, one of the things both of you have done um, is use uh, the historical matrix of Jesus to make um, his proclamation, how he's enacting the kingdom of God and such, uh, weird enough to confront our own context. Um, I I'm interested both as an educator and preacher, if, if y'all could talk a little bit about what you've learned in that, that, that kind of task of introducing the complexity of Jesus historically, uh, introducing it in ways that it problematizes a lot of unexamined questions we may have around our own culture, power, uh, and our identity really being grounded in a political vision that may not be um, compatible uh, with that of Jesus. Or uh, Brian's uh, ever-ready tweetable line earlier, uh, America's not a biblical Israel, but a biblical Babylon. That was hmm. you know, quality tweetable material, Brian. Okay. Well, I mean, this is what I do, and I probably on a Sunday morning, although I actually in my church I have used that line, but in general what I try to do, if, if I think that American Christians need to untangle their faith from their allegiance to the American empire, if I just start off like that, you know, immediately there's just so much resistance that it's futile. So what I do is I really lean into um, the historical Jesus and present him as a challenge to the Roman Empire, not in the form of a conventional violent insurrection, rebellion, that sort of thing, 
but as this almost inconceivable form of nonviolent resistance but that is indeed truly resistance. But I just, I draw the dots very closely together. Whether I'm preaching like perhaps from Daniel and trying to communicate the historical context of, uh, of you know, Jews living in, in exile, all right? And again, I understand Daniel's, you know, more like 160 B's, it's casting, I get all that. Uh, or whether I'm trying to put early Christianity in its historical context of this subversive alternative kingdom right in the midst of the Roman Empire. And then I let people kind of, I draw the dots very closely, but then the people have to make the final move to connect the dots and go, oh, well, that's kind of like, Rome's kind of like, hmm. America's kind of like Rome was back then, isn't it? And, and so when I preach that way, there's one of three options, or one of three results. I draw the dots very close, and you can make the connections. If some people never make the connection. Oh, well. Uh, some people make the connection, and they are enlightened. They really, for the first time, really see the kingdom of Christ as a radical alternative to the kingdoms of this world, and they're thrilled by it, and they press on in the journey. Others connected dots are offended by it, and, and they're gone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's, that's what happens. But, I mean, it really has been the scholars— in historical Jesus research that have given me the basic tools to then then to employ that in how I preach. And so I'm I'm grateful. I, I think the validity of this is that the whole Roman matrix becomes a mega parable. I am perfectly happy talking, well, you saw what I did in that that first uh, the world of Jesus. It's the Roman world, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't draw any parallels to to America. You don't have it. You, <laughs> here's a world in which you have two saviors. Now, I didn't invent that. That's the title of Caesar. He's the savior of the world. Mm-hmm. Not just of Rome and Mediterranean or Italy or anything. Like that. He's the savior of the world. He's got it in his hand. Well, why do you need two saviors if you've only one world? This is where I poke C.S. Lewis a little bit. It's not just that Jesus said he's God or he's, so he's right or he's nuts. Well, if two people are saying they're God, one of them is right and the other is nuts, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a choice. Then. So I think it becomes a giant parable. And I think that's valid. It is a giant parable. So it should be valid if, if Paul and all these people are right. It should be valid for anyone. It should have been valid for the... British Empire in the 19th century, the 20th century. It should be valid for us today, and it's <laughs> for the Chinese Empire if it's the next one coming down the pike, bring mm-hmm. it up to date, as it were. So I think it's valid to do that. When, when Marcus Borg and I lecture together, I mean together at the same time, Marcus was always much more likely to talk about American armaments and, you know, who has the biggest navy and all the rest of it. I would usually focus directly on Rome. Yeah. I would say the same thing. I know, I know that some of people who talked to me were more offended by Marcus than they were by me. <laughs> they were saying exactly the same thing. So the danger, I suppose, of what I was doing, they could go home and say, was it, wasn't that awful? Those awful Romans. Or those awful first century Jews, if you want, even worse. Those awful Romans. Certainly glad we're not living in the first century. That was the danger. And that's the danger of parable, if, as Jesus knows. People can, can decide it's all about agricultural um, strategies for, for Galilee or something. So I think it is a parable. And that's a way of getting people, because parables are good. I mean, Jesus uses them, so they must be good. That's what I mean. So I don't talk about myths. I don't talk about legends. Very often we'll talk about parable, maybe even Mark as a parable, or Luke yeah. Act as a parable. And that brings in the question then historicity. Well, yeah, the, the Good Samaritan has all the right ma- you know, mechanics, but it didn't happen, right? Jesus right. made it, so that's called fiction. So take it up with God if you don't like fiction. Be, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a way of gentling people into it, and I think it's perfectly valid. 
Yeah, Jesus taught with parables. Some people think, you know, to illustrate truth. I say no, because he didn't want to get killed his first week of ministry. <laughs> I mean, when, when Jesus stopped talking in parables, he was dead in a week. You know, so some you have to use parables in certain contexts to allow the truth to gradual dazzle. Dazzle gradually. Who said that? Is that Emily Dickinson, I believe? Yeah. And uh, no, no, I get all that. Yeah. Amen. And I, I wouldn't let people away with that, though. I really would not say, let them away with it. Well, Jesus is just being defensive. No. What's, what's protecting Jesus in Galilee is not the parables for the death of John. Because if I'm Antipas and I've just killed one popular prophet, it's going to take me a couple of years before I get around to the next one. No, Jesus is protected in Galilee by the fox, Antipas, who's already killed his mentor. Uh, I don't know how good that is. Now, he goes up to Jerusalem. Okay, that's much more dangerous. But even there, it takes him a week to get killed. So I don't think Jesus is looking to get himself killed. Though I, have I, don't, I don't think so either. I think, though, that, that the, the use of parables is not merely to illustrate truth. It really is to invite people to finally make the connection themselves. Because he, with his inner circle, those that have definitely already committed to him in secret or in private, he will explain the parable to them. But, you know, to the to the masses, he, he leaves it in the parable form for the, so that they can try to try to make the connection of what the kingdom of God actually looks like. Yeah. And I, I would be for myself, I would be careful there because. Mark has his own view of parables, as we know. They're riddles, and they're like Jesus' revenge for the fact that you're not on his side. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you it all in riddles, so you won't understand it. Then I'll tell the disciples in, pri in private, and they still don't understand it. The function, as I see, of a parable is to make you make the decision yourself. That's the only justification I can see for the genre. But that's the whole thing about the kingdom. Jesus can talk all he wants about the kingdom. If nobody enters it, there ain't no kingdom. You can't have a kingdom of one. So I think the parable is to, is to make them make their decision. That's what I mean by you can draw the dots and you can draw them fairly close, but you have to allow them to connect the dots. That's right. And in this case, the medium and the message, I see, are completely congruent because the medium is a, I'm not telling you, I'm challenging you. I'm telling you a story and I'm luring you, seducing you, annoying you into making a conclusion. If, if you conclude that the Samaritan was nuts for bothering <laughs> to stop and do all of that, well, I can't do much about it. I can't say, no, 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 you got the wrong interpretation. <laughs> I've trusted you <laughs> mm -hmm. with this and all Jesus could say, if a whole crowd said, oh, those Samaritans are nuts. Nah. Well, move on. Move on. <laughs> Try it somewhere mm -hmm. else. That one didn't work. <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions that came in um, uh, that, that I think really helps right here is that notion you've developed, uh, or in, you've mentioned a number of times, Dom, about how metaphors make reality. And that oftentimes... Uh, the the most prevalent uh, assumptions around religious language today are that if you said metaphor or parable or these kinds of uh, language, that you're making deflationary statements. Yeah. And in getting the matrix of Jesus clear, where uh, there are these there are already claims to divinity. There's already a political theological vision at work uh, that he's entering into. Uh, in the narrative, uh, that that claim of metaphors making reality, uh, you start to give it dirt in a sense um, historically. But uh, there was a couple questions about people wanting you to kind of uh, unpack that a bit, uh, and then there were uh, there were others that said when you have someone that's like actually has to preach sermons, uh, uh, can you can you have them talk to Dom a bit? Uh, about what that would look like, like how people in a confessional context uh, relate to their language. Because I think so often we assume like 
for something to be true, it needs to have a kind of correspondence that the teachings of Jesus, the enactment of his mission in his own historical context don't, don't fit directly. Okay. Um, I, I will ad- insist, though, that during at least 20 years before COVID, from, you know, from about 1900 on, I was preaching sermons. Now, I, I distinguish very clearly with Brian because, as I said, I'm gone. <laughs> so I do recognize that it's a different church <laughs> every Sunday, <laughs> which is kind of unique. You know, I could get away with one sermon, by the way. He couldn't. So, but I do insist, at least I, I am, was being invited to preach. Now, let me give an example. Uh, it's risky. If people in this country, let me see, metaphor is seeing as, seeing as, that's so obvious, uh, say, uh, clouds sail across the sky. We all know that one. Don't even explain it to me. It's annoying. We see the, 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 see the, the sky is like the sea, the white clouds, the boat. Hey, go. Wait a minute. Supposing this people in, uh, looking at the last election decided 90% Biden stole it from Trump and started to act accordingly. I'm not talking about a violent, res- I'm not talking about that at all. Just talking about everyone said that's the way it was. Now, that metaphor will create reality. Mm-hmm. It will. The example I use, say for example, that I use from 1933, the Third Reich is one way of seeing it, the New Deal is another. Hitler, Roosevelt, both created realities. They really did. Reality means people lived in it and they said, this is the way it is. So if you lose that, you think reality, that democracy, that's the way it is. That's reality. It is, of course, it's a way of seeing it. It's certainly the way I want to see it. I think it is better than tyranny, but tyranny is another way of seeing it. I do think that evolution is more on the side of democracy than it is of tyranny because evolution <laughs> works from the bottom up. But that's me. So be careful about metaphor. You're creating your own reality. And if you don't see that and think, well, it's just a metaphor, I think you've lost... <laughs> The meaning of existence. I, I don't even know what to say because I remember way back in, in the, um, what was it, the 60s, 1960s, talking with Paul Ricoeur, the philosopher, in, he used to come over to the University of Chicago every, every year. And he was, he was an entranced with metaphor and we were talking about parables and all the rest of it. And I was pushing him. He kept saying that metaphor changes reality. He was all for the parables of Jesus because they changed reality. And I pushed him. I said, yeah, but they also create reality. He didn't like that. But then I said, but your book is going to be called The Rule of Metaphor. That's, that's a metaphor. <laughs> you haven't got out a metaphor by talking about the rule of metaphor. So I, I could never get him to, to say it creates. Maybe he thought, well, that means we can make up anything we want. I do, of course we can make up anything we want, but we don't get away with it. That's the point. We can make the world up any way we want and live in it and good luck and see if it works. If it doesn't work, then you better get another metaphor before you destroy yourself. So the metaphor of escalatory violence that we've been working with Mm. is kind of, now we're beginning to see the cost accounting for it. So I would want to say metaphor creates reality. Please walk very carefully. I don't know how, how you know, mm-hmm. the real question was, how can you do that in the pulpit? Well, I would try to do it with people. I would try to show them how it works, not how well, it works in the simple way. Go on. Well, no, I, w- I was just thinking I mean, even earlier in Brian's example about how during Holy Week, the book you and Marcus did the last week, they'll use that to kind of set people in that context, right? And the normal questions that show up in Holy Week are – you know, all too often about uh, debating uh, uh, like literal factual debates about X, Y, and Z. And 
and and not the reality that the you know the the conflict of two very different pictures of what uh, the, the divine's realm looks like and an invitation to participate in the one that bears a cross and yet God resurrects. I mean that's that is a conflict of meta uh, you know metaphors that are making realities in conflict. And I think too often we get hung up on. Um, uh, questions that become adventures and missing the point, and then those uh, often in that that think they're taking the most conservative stance are in doing so protecting themselves from the very radical claim of the gospel um, mm-hmm. that's you know th- that's going on. Um, and I imagine that's what the questioner was getting at. Uh, I mean, what do you think, Brian? In your kind of uh, in, in your context of kind of uh, putting to the fore the way. Uh, the way the metaphorical reality that's being claimed, uh, in a sense, in the passion story, preaching in its best iteration is a form of storytelling. Um, it's amazing to me how how mesmerized people can be by hearing a story well told that they've heard a hundred times. It's the same story, and they know how it goes, but they want to hear it again. And so what what I've gained from historical Jesus research is just a way to tell the story of Jesus and transport the hearer back there. So what we do during Upper Room, during I call, I call it Holy Week in the Upper Room because we have a prayer chapel at our church called the Upper Room. And, and, and I just take them. And I, I, try, I try to transport them back in time. And here's what happened on Monday. And here's what happened on Tuesday. And here's the anointing at Bethany on Wednesday. And, 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 there, and, and, the, and people come back year after year after year to hear the same story told to them again. But that story enters in deeply. And then begins to work within them so that the story of Jesus, which is what the gospel is. The gospel is not a set of propositional truth. It's not a formula. It's not four laws. It's not a road and road. It's the story of Jesus. You can tell it very succinctly, you know, passion to resurrection. You can tell it from Bethlehem to you know, the garden tomb. You can tell it from, if you want the director's cut edition, you can go from in the beginning all the way to New Jerusalem. Uh, But it's a story. And if we can not try to form sermons as lectures, lecture belongs to the academy, it has its place, but it's not, it's not the art form that is the sermon. Uh, If we can, if we, and, and not make points, you know, uh, but tell the story of Jesus, drawing upon history and what we can know, but you can never quite reach that. That's Lessing's ditch that you can't quite, you have to leap it. But tell the story of Jesus in a compelling way, and you don't have to apply it to their life. They'll do that themselves. Tell the story and just trust the story of Jesus to be fascinating enough that somehow it will be ingested into people's own lives and will be incorporated into their story, and then transformation begins to occur. That's my experience. I, I, I'm pretty committed to that. Let, let me. I'm thinking especially of what, what I did in the world of Jesus. I mean, Sarah and I, as I mentioned, went to huge trouble to try and get to Axiom. <laughs> the pain. It ain't, on, it ain't on the main travel circuits. Because well, yeah. I wanted to see the sight that, what, that was like the birth of Augustus, if you will. Not the, you know, it's like going to Bethlehem. Um, you know, it really is. If, if you want to see what, what we're talking about in the first century, this is what you're up against. If you're claiming Jesus is the savior of the world, this guy mm-hmm. brought peace to the Roman Empire. Imagine we had 20 years, they say, of war, and then Lincoln, let's say Lincoln led the army that finally brought us peace, and then he he lasted for 40 years and wasn't assassinated. And did the whole reconstruction as well as well, you get some idea why people might say, This guy's divine, this is God and a toga. 
And if it ain't God in a toga, I don't know what we want them for. <laughs> Up there, you know, wherever they are. Down here on earth where we need them. So all of that makes absolute sense to me. And then the extraordinary thing is that anyone can come up with an alternative. At the same time, at least. Now, maybe in the middle of the second century, you might be getting fed up with them. But at the, at the age of Augustus, you have an alternative? Mm. <laughs> that takes some moxie. So I, I, would, I don't know what people would, would, would look at that first thing. Will they say, well, yeah, 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 let's get over that and we get to the real stuff with the death of Jesus and all the rest of it. Let's get out of Galilee and get to Jerusalem. I don't know, but I am certain that if you do that, you'll never know what's going on. And there, therefore, you're free to make up whatever you want. That's the advantage. If you're, if you, not because I say it. It's not because I say it. It's because this stuff is there. Even in the ruins, you can still, you can still go to Aphrodisias and be absolutely, I don't know what I just use. Wow, now I see it. Now I see it. This is, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a Greek in the first century, as I said, with a sore neck looking up. Yeah, this is superb. And the idea that somebody from the back of beyond in Galilee taking this on, it's not whether you believe in it or not. It's even that it's not a bad joke. <laughs> That's the extraordinary thing. And I think that makes sense unless you think, well, Jesus just dropped down from heaven and everyone said, okay. But then you can't explain how we wanted them dead. So right. I, I find that absolutely necessary. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'm able to achieve usually during Holy Week is understanding why there were those that wanted Jesus dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where you have to tell the story with a certain amount of historicity to it. Yeah. And you show what a threat he was to the Sanhedrin with their collusion with the power of Rome and all of that. And then it, and this is where, at least in the past, Jesus films have been so weak is you never can quite figure out why, why does he get killed in the end? Right? I mean, he's going around, he's healing people and he's talking about peace and love and then they kill him. Why? And uh, it, it's, but, but once people understand that, in fact, this proclamation and enactment of a kingdom that comes from the heavens is a challenge to the kingdoms of this age. And then I really like that. I really lean into that moment when the Sanhedrin says, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the moment that they take off the mask. Yeah. And they say, okay, let's let's make sure we're on the same page here. You play in politics, we play in religion, but we're all playing the same game. It's proximity to power. And we we will don ourselves in clerical robes and we will play at religious games. But when it's all said and done, we are both trying to get close to power, and we know that power is whoever has the most lethal force, and that's Caesar. And so we have no king but Caesar. Now we're going to put our mask back on and play at religion, yeah. but we're on the same page here. Yeah. And of course, I think that is what Pilate was trying to get them to do. I don't. He's not trying to liberate Jesus. I think. I think he just wanted to kind of humiliate the same. Oh yeah, leader. he's been at it for ten years. Um, it's really important because otherwise, in the creed, all of a sudden, Pontius Pilate drops drops down from heaven. Oh, where did he come from? And you're left. You're left. You're quite. He right. him like a rogue, is what I say. But okay. <laughs> and the bad part then is where anti-Semitism comes in. Because how else can you yeah. explain this nice guy who pats little babies and tells little stories? And it must be the bad Jews. Forget he was one, but it must be them. You have no idea what Caiaphas is up to as a quizzling or anything else. So I find that I want people to, to get that up front. I, I, I want them to, as you know, I use the term matrix to avoid context and text that they can't separate it. There's only one word for it. It's what you got to know to know what's going on. And to get them into it early in the thing. 
Yeah, to avoid to avoid the problems of anti-Semitism, I'll also tell this. I'll often tell the story anachronistically, and I'll talk about Jesus being crucified through a collusion of church and state. I just say church, you know. That's perfect. That's Josephus' summary is the best we can ever do. The the first man among us accused him to Pilate. We're not going to get any better than that. The first man among us would be mm-hmm. high priestly circles. The only thing you have to add to that is that they were not, not, not considered representative of the ordinary people. I don't mean they were richer. Right. I mean that the first time the ordinary people got a chance, they started to assassinate them. Not mm-hmm. probably a nice thing to do, but it gives you an idea of the, they didn't represent. They, they weren't, the ordinary people didn't think they represented them, not because they were rich. I don't mean that, but because they were collaborators with Rome. Yeah, yeah, and they knew that. They knew that, and therefore the whole temple had become a seat of collaboration rather than the house of God and everything else. So if, if people are ready for that, then the question becomes, which we touched that, how did he last so long? <laughs> Not how, why on earth did he get killed? Yeah. Why wasn't he killed by Antipas? And I've suggested one answer for that. <laughs> John's death protects him for X number of years. Or did he go up to Jerusalem? That's the question we'd be asking the third lecture. Uh, what's it? The third lecture, yeah. Did he go up to get himself killed? In which case, why did it take a week? Why didn't Pilate do it by what we call Pam Sunday evening? And I mean, you could you could make divine, you know, reasons for that. I know, but basically, that raises the question: Did Jesus? Well, I mean, he's also he's also not staying in Jerusalem at night. And the first time he stays in the proximity of Jerusalem at night, then he's arrested. Exactly, exactly. You can watch him. That would be my argument not reading jesus's mind as i said but he has the crowd protects him during the day in the temple that's a good old mark every night get out of jerusalem far away i mean it's it's there's a full moon but you know people disappear in dark streets and (laughs) they just disappear so get out everything i see him doing that i can see is trying not to get killed yeah. I think my interpretation is, he's, as you know, is he's invited to Jerusalem. I imagine them, I, I don't know this, but I imagine them saying, you know, if you're serious about this kingdom of God, get out of those dumps up in Galilee, come to where the action is at the capital. This is this is where the important stuff get done. You know, come to Washington, as it were. Yeah, you, you, can, you can sit here in St. Joseph, Missouri and call yourself the president, but at some point you've got to go to Washington if you're going to make that claim. If you're going to claim to be king, tacitly or however, then eventually you've got to go to the Capitol. And if you walk around Washington saying, I am the president, the Secret Service will ask you, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah. If you're just, uh, you know, say, well, I'm just a little president of Missouri. They're fine, fine. But be careful in the capital. Because the, mm-hmm. <laughs> and be careful at Passover in the capital. We have zero toleration. So I would hope that we that none of this makes people think, oh, I have to be an expert. And just, no, you really don't. You just have to know the common sense of what was going on at the time. And there's people who will help you do it. Mm-hmm. There, there really are. And it's... No, you don't have to be a scholar. <laughs> I know I know enough scholars of the classics that make me never want to read them again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One of the questions that came in uh, under you know, different shapes was really around the collision of visions between the world, uh, you know, symbolically there in the picture of Caesar with the globe and spear and the one uh, Jesus pierced um, and, and how that, the contrast that you laid out, Dom was rather sharp, but that contrast is not something that's often familiar when you think of um, popular accounts of the kingdom of God or of justice or salvation, that the horizon of those, you know, the picture of God's, work is so much more narrow and individualistic um, that that while there may be those macro uh, powers at play in the present, when it goes to reintroducing the vision of Jesus and the kingdom he proclaims, uh, 
the religious vision he's conflicting with is one that tends to be more narrowed to thinking about personal salvation, afterlife, these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of things. Um, and so, uh, knowing that there are a number of questions that are, you know around that, especially from two of the churches that said, oh, "We love the you know the first lecture and this conflicting thing," and yet. Uh, most of our church probably thinks salvation has to do with individuals escaping eternal conscious torment, not, you know, like joining yeah. God in a, a redemptive and restorative form of uh, justice. Uh, so, so maybe if you could kind of unpack that contrast, uh, Dom, and then uh, Brian, like how yeah, you see thanks. that challenge playing out in congregations where uh, these kind of more narrow personal individualistic framings dominate. Two things fast. It's ironic because I suppose one of the most famous quotations is God so loved the world. Now, if God loved the world, of course, I'm in it. So I take it for granted. That's fine. That includes me. But I don't start by saying, which the local church puts on bumper stickers, God loves you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could love you, but not the world. But if I start with the world, it includes me. If I start with, with me, I'm... <laughs> so... I will have emphasized that. God loves the world. Also, uh, the book that you mentioned, um, read, uh, on Easter. I lost it. I was supposed to reinventing Easter. Most people don't know that there's a Western tradition of Easter and an absolutely radically different Eastern one. Resurrecting Easter. Look, the Western tradition looks to me like ascension. Jesus goes up alone and most of the Greco-Roman world, all of it, in fact, Jews and, and Greeks and Romans would all say, yeah, we know about ascension. <laughs> we don't think your guy did, but our guy did. Fine. So guys do. Now, there's this other vision, resurrection, which is about responsibility and accountability for the whole world. That finally, there's cosmic justice. Ouch, not just justice for me, but for the whole world. Wow. That's, when I see the Eastern tradition, and, and it has to be Adam and Eve. You can begin others if you want. But Adam and Eve, I thought those were the bad guys, the problematic things. God's taking them out by the hand. Mm -hmm. That means, I mean, how can resurrection be for the whole human race? The Anastasis is Necron. That's plural in Greek. And it, if you say it in English, resurrection of the dead, you might mean the dead one, Jesus. Because dead for us can be, you know, singular or plural, as it were. He's dead, we're dead, they're dead. But the Greek tradition, I can't even take it literally. How can I imagine Jesus coming out from where with Adam and Eve by the hand? How do you take that literally? But if you take it as a metaphorical vision of cosmic justice and accountability and responsibility and consequences, not punishments, I find it it's almost a description of where we are. So I don't know how to get away from that. And I that again was experience. I didn't know all this stuff until we started around the year 2000 going all over in search of Paul <laughs> That's what we were doing in Turkey. We weren't going there for Byzantine stuff. That just was there and we couldn't avoid it. And we can't say, wait a minute, how come the whole Eastern tradition, mm -hmm. that Sarah and I kept going over by ourselves two weeks before, and we go to Romania, we go to Cyprus, we go everywhere. And finally, got, the whole Eastern tradition is like this. So anyone who's talking about Resurrection and imagining Jesus coming out of souls. We're just talking about the Western tradition. I don't even know how to to absorb that fully into myself yet. Yeah, I uh, I have found that you can preach all of this on a Sunday morning in church. I, I don't know how to do an Easter service anymore without incorporating an Orthodox Anastasis icon. And and I just I walk people through it. I said, look, you know, this is this is one movement. You see the fluttering of Jesus robe as he's descending the gates of hell, following in the form of a cross, the broken locks and chains. He's grabbing 
Adam and Eve, Adam and Hava, humanity and life by the wrists. You know, they, they have no choice in the matter, and he's pulling them up out of their graves. Um, and then you have the issue in the in the general evangelical world of you, you have you have personal savior. And I just, this comes out of revivalism. This comes, you know, you have a you have a baptized continent and everybody is a de facto Christian and you have this impulse. OK, but shouldn't we actually have some intentionality about our faith? Shouldn't we actually live it? And so you, you develop this language of personal savior, but it very quickly degenerates into private savior. Yeah. And so this has been a lot of my work is try to understand that salvation is a kind of belonging. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God incessantly, rarely uses the word salvation. Paul talks about salvation all the time, occasionally refers to the kingdom, but not too often. But the point is, they're not talking about two different things. They're talking about the same thing, and that salvation is understood not as an individual, personal, private transaction between me and God, but as a belonging to God's alternative society that Jesus calls the kingdom or government or reign and rule of God. And, and I, I don't have any difficulty preaching that. Now, it takes a while for people to get it. You have to kind of be persistent at it and creative in how you do it. But I would say most of the people that belong to Word of Life Church here in St. Joseph, they they understand that now. And they, they came, most of them, not all of them, but most of them came from some version of evangelicalism, but they understand salvation as a kind of belonging. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, and the, the images are important for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, in one sense, I knew this stuff from the Eastern Fathers. I read it, and it sounded lovely stuff. But you know, <laughs> I, it, it was just—it was like, <laughs> honestly, I, I didn't know what to do with it. People called it mystic. Fine, you could you could let it drift away until you go into these churches and see this. Mm-hmm. And it, it struck me, especially as you know, in my own again, it's autobiography. Because Marcus and I, were, we, we're running a bar cross and pilgrimage every year to Turkey, okay? 40 people. And we were seeing these Byzantine stuff during the day because we had to, even though we were talking about Paul. But at night, each of us do half our lecture before dinner and the wine. Um, now, you're going to talk about Paul and the resurrection and you've just seen this thing? I couldn't avoid it. Yeah. I don't want to let on. I knew all this. I didn't know this stuff. And it was it was the two things hitting. You were in Goremi and Cappadocia looking at this stuff in the church. And that evening, I want to talk about Paul. And of course, I'm not, I want to choose that evening to talk about 1 Corinthians 15, of course. Because I don't think it would have happened otherwise. I, I don't even want to say this is scholarship. This is like being hit over the head with a mallet. <laughs> Don't you see it? <laughs> How can you not see it? And then, then we start watching for it in other Byzantine churches. Yeah, I can tell you that people seeing it, it's transformative. And that's why in our church, we have a whole series of icons that, that, you, that you see on the, the platform. But what they are is they are the modern icons out of the Lviv school. Ours are from Ivanka Demchuk. And these are, this is a young school, this is the school of young artists in Lviv, Ukraine, who operate within the traditional theological parameters of iconography, but are not necessarily limited to the Byzantine style of art. So the essentials theologically are still present, but it doesn't look like it's, you know, 1500 years old. It it looks like, I, I see how this is also simultaneously contemporary and, and I if, if people out there haven't exam haven't discovered the work of just Google Ivanka Demchuk and then there's others but she's the one I know um, it's, it's it's tremendous stuff they're doing and I don't just mean it's it's beautiful art although it is I mean it's theologically compelling and I really love what they're doing and I don't know about this so I want to hear more about it I mean very I often- I think you'd be very interested. I really do. Yeah, I'm going to have you send me a that reference because I want you know, I of the places that we were that were on our list that we didn't get to for obvious reasons. Ukraine was high, but mm. 
Yeah, we were in Turkey, so it was just across the, the sea. So we get to that. That's no problem. We take two weeks before we do our trip to Turkey and just go to Ukraine. So Ukraine was always the easy one, so it was postponed, unfortunately. Mm. I, I still, you know, I'm terribly regretful. But very often we were there in May, and very often it was right after Christmas, uh, Eastern Christmas. I, Easter, I mean. Mm-hmm. For example, in Belgrade Cathedral, when you walked in, this is the Sunday after, after the, their Easter, there was a red carpet going all the way up towards the iconostasis, and then there was the, you know, the loops to, to guide you up. And there on, on a stand, there was an icon. It was it was a modern icon, but it was classical icon, just copy in modern times. Mm-hmm. And everyone who came in before during the service, was <laughs> they wandered around during the service, as you know, would go up to it, kiss it, and touch it with their head. Okay, I did my head, but I didn't do the kiss. Okay, <laughs> um, so this was modern, obviously. And in the little church that we, uh, the church in in uh, Cyprus. Platters where we stayed, our driver told us that at Easter, uh, Easter Eve in the church, they had the the priest outside. Let me think about it. No, the, the priest, I think, was inside the door, holding the door, and the strongest person in the village, a big guy, pushed in, and she thought, as, as you know the story, she said, she was asking, why is that? That's so unfair. And we were always laughing. This was, they were reenacting. Yeah. It was coming in to the place of the dead. And I never knew that. I never saw it done, actually, but because you were never there. Who is the king of glory? The king of glory, Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. You know, they, they pound on the door. And yeah, I, yeah, I know about this. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> okay. So this, this question uh, is. Jumping ahead, it was submitted on week four's uh, agenda, but y'all both brought it up, and it, you, you yeah, get the contrast it. here as well too. Um, uh, and it, and it's because it, the line came up for multiple reasons. Uh, Gail asks, uh, w- w- "What w- w- I've you know you Dom's lecture provoked me to think about the line in the creed descent into hell again." Um, this conversation here, right about the icons. Uh, and and the kind of global invitation of the gospel uh, that that's for all humanity, this resurrection image, like versus like personal salvation and ascension, uh, is is connected to it as well because uh, right like the idea that Brian's like we put the icons up or and 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 Dom and Sarah are seeing these pictures and these pictures address us with a different kind of imagination, an invitation to imagination than when we just read text or we dig into history, right? They, there's a different kind of modality uh, that's there. And and I wonder if uh, that invitation uh, that the creed gives can be framed in a different way, right? Like that notion of descent into hell. Um, Gail put it that way, but we had two different church groups bring that up specifically uh, it, it, as to what to do with it, one of them, a, a, a progressive mainline congregation uh, that, that had a, there was a long uh, excursus on it of sorts uh, after watching the lecture uh, on, uh, you know, week four, the week four lecture. Um, and, and the other uh, for someone who, who's a very much more evangelical uh, clergy that said, you know, we are looking to it and we don't use the creeds, you know, no creed, but Christ or the Bible, depending on your thing. Yeah. And you just get that one verse in the New Testament that hints at it. Um, but, but I, but I wonder if there's something to be gained by wrestling with that line in the creed again, in the same way that say the, the art uh, and these icons provoke a different avenue uh, to uh, enliven our imaginations to think about uh, Easter. I, I was wondering, I ask Brian f- first on this, does that come up, for, has that come up for you, the creed, or is it just not operating? We, can, we confess the creed every Sunday, and we say, we use the line, descended to the dead. Okay. We say, descended, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's it's ha- Hades, ha- I, I think that he descended to the dead. Yeah. yeah. And and we and that's we preach it that way and um and th- this is the way you know you read the patristic sermons regarding Easter mm-hmm. and all the action is in the realm of the dead that yeah. 
Yes. That Jesus can enter into death because he's mortal, but death cannot digest divinity. And he comes not as a conquest, but as a conqueror and liberates all of the dead. And so you know, Paul plays with Psalm 68 in Ephesians 4 and says, well, captivity, that is the captives of death, are now Jesus' captives. And, but, but they're captives for resurrection. And This is the easiest stuff in the world to preach. It's fun. It's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> and again, watch what happens. I mean, in the beginning, we we're talking about Hades. It's, it's the, the place of the dead. It's not mm-hmm. the place of punishment. Right. Good old Hades, Hades, the guy, he's the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. He's got to get a job. His job is to hold the gates, keep people in. Now, keep Jesus out. It, it, you know, Jesus comes right in, as you said, and flattens him. He probably says, don't take this personally. You know, just you're in the way. <laughs> so, the, real, the real fascinating thing is when the Latins came along and had to translate Hades, and they translated it as hell, and painted themselves into a theological corner. Exactly. Which drove... We drove St. Augustine wild almost because the bishop, another bishop asked him, well, look, if Jesus liberated people from hell and nobody gets out of hell, according to our theology, then maybe there'll be nobody in hell on the last day because hell is a place of punishment. And you see, you can see in the, in the iconography eventually, Hades, who's a strong, burly, bearded man, becomes replaced by his horrible demon, Satan is taking over, but but nobody gets out of hell. So they, they've got themselves in the theological bind, and Augustine trying to explain this. Oh, well, the, it's not how the Eastern Fathers preached it. Yeah. <laughs> the Eastern Fathers just basically said, yeah, Jesus emptied hell or death or Hades, whatever word you want to use. Yeah, they would have said Hades, but but the, it's, the point is Hades was never a place of punishment. Right. It was a place for all the dead. It's a great big condominium complex where all the dead go, you know, under the under the ground. Well, like, it, yeah, it's the rough equivalent of the Hebrew Sheol. It's it's the realm of the dead. You, you don't necessarily yeah. want to be there, but it's not necessarily either. It's not a place of punishment or torture. It's just it's not life. It's, yeah, yeah, and it's it's a place you'd like to get out of. It's yeah. it's yeah. it's it's the that gray town in C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Yeah. yeah. Um. <clears throat> When it becomes hell, though, there's a theological problem in the Western tradition. And you can, if you go to the whole um, iconography, historically, you can see when Satan comes in, it becomes a problem. How can people get out from, from, from Satan's hell when you're using hell in the Latin sense of the place yeah. of punishment? So the harrowing of hell is something like to keep Jesus busy on Saturday night He's had a hard day on Friday. He's got nothing to do on Saturday. On Sunday is going to be the resurrection. So they separate clearly the harrowing of hell or the descent into limbo, which is the real Catholic one. Because limbo, you can get out of. So the descent into limbo. We have seen again and again images of the, the anastasis where it says on the text, this is, I'm thinking of icons in, in Greece, where it says, hey, Anastasis, on the text, it says Anastasis. Yeah. Down below, it say descent into limbo, in the explanation of it. it, it they're trying to explain something that doesn't fit into their theology. Nobody mm-hmm. got out of hell. Well, he didn't go to hell. He just went to limbo. Well, if he harrowed hell, that's just something kind of to keep him he, he went there to give a sermon. He preached to the dead. He, he didn't. He proclaimed. He carousined to the dead. And the message was, we're, we're out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not to hell with you, out of hell with you, <laughs> is the message of the Anastasis. So I, I've watched the Latin theology torture itself mm-hmm. in images, especially in images, to try and explain how is Jesus taking Adam and Eve out of hell? <laughs> By the wrists, he's pulling them up out. That's how he's doing it. <laughs> By the wrists. <laughs> so, um, okay, we got, I will do one more question here. And this one, um, I, I think, 
I imagine it's directed towards Dom, but I, I'm not 100 yeah. percent. Sh- well, I mean towards Brian, uh, and and this was about uh, book recommendations for non scholars that this conversation mm-hmm. was new to. I can imagine people, um, and, and you know, we get it in a lot of the questions, uh, and I eventually got to the point of. Uh, cutting and pasting some of my book recommendations and replies. Uh, but um, you know, one of the things that you see is, uh, it, like in your own work, Brian, is is church planting and being a part of the Jesus People Movement and that kind mm-hmm. of evangelical charismatic space and your own relationship both to historical Jesus research thing, and you talked about a number of Dom's books at the beginning, and then also this kind of reconnection to the broader part of the church where the Eastern church, so many of the anxieties American Christianity is built on were resolved years ago. Um, and in this kind of like uh, bigger, richer, more cosmic, uh, account of the faith, um, for, for people, this is new to, uh, that, you know, don't require a large amount of, uh, you know, scholarly a priori and such, uh, are, are there particular books, uh, Brian, you think that? Yeah, I mean, of course, Don's Resurrecting Easter, but also uh, there's a book by uh, mm, Hilarion Alfia. <laughs> it's Christ the Conqueror of Hell, The Descent into Hades from an Orthodox Perspective. This is St. Vladimir Seminary, 2009. Uh, that's a helpful book. Uh, if I can plug my own, I talk about these themes in uh, The Wood Between the Worlds. It's a mm-hmm. book that's just out that maybe, you know, I kind of I try to stand between the academy and the pew and, and sort of try to be a translator and help with that. Uh, tangentially related would be David Bentley Hart's That All Shall Be Saved, which I think is an excellent, I think I've read that like four times and... Uh, that's 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 not a terribly academic book. I think that's generally accessible. So there's three or four right there. Yeah, and, and one of them, um, uh, you know, one of the people that often gets recommended, and that is Brian McLaren, who'll be uh, on mm-hmm. the live stream next week uh, with Dom and I. Um, the uh, the the other the other kind of uh, recommendation question, Dom, that that came in is. Uh, for people that are new to biblical, historical, critical reflection, um, is there an intro book where uh, where they can go back in and dig more? Like um, uh, one of our members, Michael, said, you know, I love the example of Herod's boat explaining Antipas and uh, his exploitation system and stuff. But is that like commonly assumed? Are there other features you would point to? Obviously, it works really good for a lecture or like uh, the, when you were introducing Roman imperial theology and the different options in Jewish life where the fourth philosophy emerges. They get, uh, for people that are really – that that the uh, kind of background knowledge where your presentation exists, are there particular texts uh, you would point them back to uh, that, that summarize and introduce kind of I don't know, the shared common knowledge of the Academy of Sorts. All right, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, people should read, should read Josephus. I mean, I, I don't know how to get around it. I mean, I, I don't know, honestly, another scholar who emphasized the fourth philosophy as nonviolent resistance. I, I just don't know it. It seems to me it's all in Josephus. It's it's not a discovery. It's there. And and he speaks through gritted teeth about it. He hates it worse. You know, people go to war. That's what happens. with this nonviolent resistance against Rome. I think it was invented in Judaism. Nonviolent mm-hmm. resistance I'm talking about. Not nonviolence. I mean. It's not enough to say Jesus was nonviolent. Rome loved nonviolent people, gave them medals, <laughs> sent them back to Galilee. It's nonviolent resistance. That's in Josephus, if Jesus never existed. They were experimenting, I think the Pharisees actually, between 6 CE and 66. And that's 60 years, which is typical, between two great onslaughts by the legions. 
What are you thinking about? Waiting for the next one? Some people are figure, trying to figure out, is there another form of resistance? So I, I don't know. I wish I could say, well, somebody else says it. I don't know it. I, I saw it in Josephus. Um, the book that was most important for me, look, look at the title, The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus. The title says it all, The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus, filled with images. Look at the images if you find the text. Um, I don't know anywhere else that you get it that way. It, it gives you the whole propaganda of images, and it's part of the reason why I'm using images now. So I, in that sense, I don't know of a shortcut. Yeah, the, the only ones that pop to my, that come to my mind that, well, people have thanked me if I recommend, okay. which, you know, there's, there's always that distinction. You, I recommend a lot of books, and then people mm -hmm. are like, oh, that was actually helpful. Um, Warren Carter has a short book that was called like the Roman empire in the new Testament, mm -hmm. because he pulls out a lot of the direct yeah, quotes, perfect. uh, from correspondence between Roman people and, uh, the kind of political theology of Rome and then from Josephus and such. And, um, did, Richard Horsley had one book that was, you know, for a more general audience, I think it. I think it's Jesus and Empire. Yeah, um, that's a good book. I've read that a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Almost anything, anything by, by Richard. Anything. I've read everything he's written, I think. He was saying it way back before people were saying it. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did that that the smaller one that he did, I've had people not find painful when they go read it. Uh the uh, Jesus and Empire, it's um, let's see if I can find it. It's yeah. Jesus and empire, the kingdom of God and the new world disorder. It's a subtitle. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a good one. Well, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Brian, for hanging out with us and joining the conversation. Uh, this has been uh, quite a bit of fun. Uh, thank you all for all the questions. Remember everyone that's a uh, part of the group. Um, we'll be back at the same time next week. Brian will be here. Uh, if you, have questions. The other Brian. The other Brian, <laughs> even though yeah. when my computer restarting, I started the Brian session for next yeah, week. I was trying to get in and I couldn't get in because <laughs> you'd sent me the Brian McLaren oh, link. No, yeah, I sent you all the correct <laughs> link and then my uh, computer update started doing auto update and you're like sitting there with it slowly going, you know, and I'm like, oh no, what's going on? So uh, the, and then I'm like, I got two minutes and then I hit start and it was the wrong Brian. Oh but, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he'll be here next week. Um a reply to any of the class emails with questions. Uh it is helpful if people do name what session it was. Like there were like 90 some that were this is for session 1. Some of them were specific like oh I want to hear Brian and Dom talk about this. Others were like here's stuff on the lecture and things. So uh feel free to send more follow-up questions uh if you have them as well. Uh and if there are things you know that you're like Brian McLaren and Dom talking, they should definitely discuss X, Y, and Z, uh, do it. But real treat to hang out with you, uh, Reverend Zond. And, uh, yeah, it, you, show sir. your brand new book. Hold on. I'm going to put you on the big screen again. Um, it's, you know, this is a case where I hope you can judge the book by the cover because the cover is gorgeous. My goodness. The wood between the worlds, a poetic theology of the cross. Oh yeah. well, it, yeah, that that's awesome. It is a pretty cover, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I didn't have anything to do with it, but it's really great. We'll see if you you know uh, Dom 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 lucked out by by being married to a photographer, so he he gets uh, high quality photos throughout <laughs> throughout his books, <laughs> and she can do graphic design. So I'm just Ooh, saying, yeah, Dom, she yeah. Can do stuff with micro with uh, Adobe too. Some of it's even legal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All righty. Well, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. It was it was a privilege. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Ryan, at least. Even, even this way, electronically. Yeah. Yes, hopefully in person someday. Someday. Yeah. Hey, 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 you made it to the end of the episode. If you want to join the class, get the lectures, go to crossingclass.com. 
And if you want to support the podcast, then head to homebrewedcommunity.com. Would really, 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 really appreciate it. Peace out. Smoochie boochie.